This video is part of the Public Health to Data Science Rebrand Program. Okay, hello everybody and welcome to today's workshop. And I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see if I do it right here. Um, thank you everybody. Oh, here you'll see that I'm on GitHub, but what I meant to show you was this um, PowerPoint. So today I'm, we're gonna be talking about GitHub up until now, we've been talking a lot about blogging. And one thing I wanna make sure I, I show you is the function of blogging when you are, so if you weren't in public health or healthcare and you went to like an engineering or a data science degree, one of the things they're having you do is portfolio projects. But another thing they're doing is they're talking about your data science journey. And I was like, what? So a data science journey to these people is the journey from not really getting what data is about to knowing how to handle data, knowing how to make decisions about data and knowing, um, knowing what to do with it. This is a weird framework, isn't it? Like we're not used to that. Like in public health, we learn study design, we learn statistics. And so we can do the statistics and answer the study design. And the, the concept of a journey just isn't there. Like, that just doesn't happen. Like we get the skills and then we start doing work. Um, I mean, we have careers, but we don't think about a journey from going to, from not knowing anything to knowing everything you need to know. Like we, we just don't really think of it that way, but they think of it that way. And my question to them is always, well, how do you know where you're going on this journey? Like, how do you know where the road is and stuff? And that actually is the reason I have this mentoring program for you, because everybody doesn't know where they're going. They're winding around on the journey and they don't know where they're going. Okay, it's because it is a really generic concept of a data science journey. So that's the bad side of the data science journey. The good side of the data science journey is, so this is another thing. You know, I was just talking before we started about the concept of episodic memory that, you know, I, I was sharing this thing that happened um, in like 20 years ago uh, in this college class I was in with Mika where we were assigned a textbook that was green and it was very confusing to us. And after two weeks, we sort of mutinied and said, don't, can't we have a better textbook? And we were referred to a blue textbook. I, I know which textbooks these are. I'll never forget that. That's episodic memory. And if I was teaching, that would be great that I had that memory, right? Because then I would have remembered if this was like the odds, something to do with the odds ratio, I'd remember about an odds ratio. So episodic memory, creating episodes in the classroom is a good way of helping your learners learn. Another good way of helping learners learn is making them reflect on what they just learned. So if you take college courses now in the age past COVID, what you'll find is a lot of discussion board assignments are about reflect on what we read. How would you, you know, respond to, you know, how would you prevent the Tuskegee syphilis, you know, project, which was so horrible from happening again, you know, like, and, and so you've read a lot and then you create a solution or you talk about your solution. Well, I found an example of a blog post where somebody's on their data science journey and that's literally why they're blogging, okay? I mean, if somebody finds this blog post and it's helpful to them, in fact, I kept it because I thought it might be helpful to us. We have, um, you know, this, this thing, he's basically say, describing how he solved a problem in our markdown with WordPress and trying to get something to look a certain way, okay? And you might be like, okay, well, I, I'm not sure if this is really that exciting. Who cares? He did it so he could remember kind of what he did. You know, this is part of his learning experience. So this is your data science journey. So I'm trying to get you to blog for your data science journey to help you with that. But one big important piece of blogging is putting actually code out there. And that's where Git, GitHub comes in and that's the point of view from which I'm going to give this workshop. It's from the point of view of a maybe beginning data scientist, even though we're not really beginning. We're advanced, but we're beginning to act like data scientists. So we're going on a data science journey, and this is the first time we're doing it, so we're kind of beginning when it comes to GitHub. So GitHub can be used for a lot of things, but this 
workshop is about using it for our particular purpose. And then here, let's see. So first in this workshop today, I'm gonna speak a lot because I wanna give you the back background of what GitHub really is. And that is some, it has this complex functioning that you need to know about, but we're not gonna do anything with it today. Okay, so that's the first part of this workshop is just so you understand that. And I wanna make sure you understand that functionality because we might use it in the future, all right? What we are gonna try and actually get accomplished in our workshop today is creating our GitHub account, which isn't hard and Mika already has hers. And then we're gonna create a test repository. You'll understand what that is. And also I have a test repository already. Mika, I've been looking at her, she has one already. Um, and then Beth and Saqib, you'll make your GitHub accounts if you don't have one. And then we'll make sure you have a test repository, okay? And then we're gonna play around in the test repository today. I realized it would be easier to add the blog repository for, you know, that is connected with your blog after you have your first blog post with code. So you're gonna start your blog, maybe you'll have some blog posts that don't have any code. You know, it just depends on what you're writing about. But as soon as you have a blog post with code where we need to publish some code, that's when we should probably, we'll take a look at your blog and what, you know, do a little art direction and set up your uh, uh, repository connect with the blog. All right, so, um, and I'm gonna try and look at the chat. If you have any questions, you can just put them in the chat or if I don't notice it, you can just break up, break into what I'm saying and I'll talk. All right, so this is the first part, which is the really, uh, intellectually intensive part. And this, I want you to ask questions if you don't understand what I'm saying, okay? Because this is kind of complex. Okay, Git and GitHub are open collaboration tools, okay? So Git is not GitHub. Now, if you think of the word hub, hub kind of means like a central place where you can store stuff or where you can access stuff, you know, like a downtown hub for a subway system. So just remember that, that that's what hub means. So you kind of thinking, well, GitHub must be some centralized location where Git happens somehow. And if you think that you're thinking right, okay? So what is Git? Git is a distributed version control system. So I already have a version control system. If you watch my ETL video, how to do the ETL pipeline, you'll see that I've got these, this code, you know, I've got this code where if I import, you know, a certain data set and I transform it and I read it out, I've got these naming conventions. Well, and if you work with me, you'll find that I'll, I'll have this versioning well we'll do v1 or v2 or v3 and i'll store old things in old so that's a version control system where you have you have rules about what you name stuff because of versions and what files you don't use and retire and archive what's different about git so i'm talking about a manual basically version control system where we communicate like okay i'm doing version 26 and i'll send it to you and you're going to edit it and change it to version 27 send it back to me, I'll edit version 28, you know, that's a manual system. A distributed version control system is basically one that's automated, where there's some sort of hub that's controlling the versions and sort of keeping them on track, right? It's kind of like there's someone at the hub that's, that's acting like a traffic cop for the version. Like, imagine we were all writing against the same document, and there was this this um, service in the middle, like if I was writing on a document and everybody's writing it at the same time, and there was a service in the middle that kept updating what we were writing in real time so we knew what it looked like, which would probably drive me crazy. I mean, that's probably a bad example, but that would be like a distributed version control system because all over the place, as we were writing on it, it would be updating in real time and we could see what was happening. It would not be my manual one where I go version 26, okay, I had to, Okay, now you edit it. You do version 27. And then if I look in version 27 and you erased my paragraph, I can go get it from version 26 and put it back. That's manual. This distributed version control system does 
does it all for you. But of course, you have to cooperate with it. You have to, to learn its commands and learn how to do things and work with its tools. So if you hear these terminologies, like the function that actually versions the code. So Git is running inside and it, it, it'll version your code. And it's associated with these terms, this term fork, clone, commit, push. And I'm going to use and define these terms. But all of that, <clears throat> all of that terminology is associated with this service of distributing the ver version control system. Now, if you're thinking, well, Monica, you were just on GitHub. Uh, it looks like a web page to me. You're right. <laughs> GitHub is basically a web page, okay? And if you want to use the Git uh, uh, service, basically, or the system with GitHub, what you really have to do is download some software, which kind of acts like a front end. Like you're, it's kind of acts like your local front end where you're doing your coding. And GitHub kind of acts like the back end where the code is, is residing and getting versioned and by Git. And the app that you download and connect up has the Git in it that's doing the versioning on GitHub. So GitHub, in, if you were using it for open collaboration, which we're not going to do today anyway, um, if you were using GitHub, Git and GitHub for open collaboration, why we need GitHub is the it, it's the place where the code has to be because Git is just versioning it. It's not storing it. Right. So this is kind of GitHub is kind of parallel to when we're on WordPress and we want to show an image, we have to upload that image and it's on WordPress's server. And we're pretty happy it's there because then we can refer to that image in our, you know, GitHub README. Right. That so so you can see that that image is hosted on the WordPress server. Well, GitHub is a server that will host this code that keeps getting versioned. Now, if you need to run the code or do anything with the code, it has to go back into some app, right? Like it's it's doing something, you know, with some app. Now, part of the reason I don't know much about this, and I know Mika's used it on a, a project she did. Somebody else, like, I guess, set it up and gave her the app and told her what to do. Um, I think the reason I haven't ever needed to use this is because I don't know how this works with SAS. And I don't, Mika, you weren't using SAS when you guys, when you did that um, competition and you used no, it. No, we didn't. We are using Python. Okay. You know, that makes total sense, Mika, because I don't think, I don't think you can do this with SAS. I'll only if you, if anybody wants to, I'll look it up and I'll see, but I, I just don't think so. Okay, so now if if you're not sure about this, don't worry. I'm going to just explain it, and then in a few slides, and and if I'm wrong, Mika, you know, break in if you think that I'm not quite right because I have a little trouble understanding how it works. Um, but here it is. Okay, so let's let's start here. Let's say you start um, and create a GitHub repository. OK, you've seen my repositories. A repository is just kind of a folder with files in it. And they're code files. But you see, I put data files in there. You can put um, PDFs in there. I think, I think you put different kinds of files. OK, so let's say you create a GitHub repository that is only edited by you, you like nobody else is editing it. And it, the only way you edit it by is by logging into GitHub directly, like you don't use one of those apps I was describing. If you do that, which is kind of what I'm doing with my GitHub, you know, I have some repositories. I have two that I edit that I created, and it's just to publish code. And I'm the only one editing them, and I'm I'm logging in to do it. Because I'm doing that, I'm never going to need this versioning capability. I'll never need to worry about the concept of push or pull or any of these things I'm going to talk about. But now we're going to go into our scenario. Let's say that I created a, a repository and I because I wanted to build an app and I kept working on the repository and working on it myself. And then I came to a point where I needed help. 
I really, I wanted teammates, like I have Mika and teammate one, teammate two. I wanted them to help me. At that point, what would happen is, first of all, we would select, I guess, some software to use because then we would start using Git and we'd choose some software to Git. So we all install, install the software locally on our local computer. You know, there's a version here, version here, version here. And if I created this original repository, what I would do is I'd say, okay, you now we all need to clone this repository. And you know, the word clone means it's to create a copy of it. So this person creates a local clone. Here's a clone and here's a clone. Um, so now we have now that we've made clones and we've distributed this, we now have to worry about the whole push pull commit all these other terminologies. So uh, so now now we we're here. we we've set up the repository. Everybody's downloaded an app on their local computer. They've connected the repository and they've taken a local clone. Okay, now imagine teammate two over here makes changes to some of the code. And she's editing it on her local machine through the app they're using. And let's say she's done and she wants to commit, she commits the code, meaning it's kind of like it's done. It's, and it runs on her local machine. And she's telling them she wants to push this commit up to the central repository. And so she has to ask everybody, are you ready if I can do a push? And if they say yes, then she commits her local machine and then pushes the commit up to the repository. So now the now her machine has synchronized to the repository, okay? And now let's say that Mika wants to update her local version, okay? But she's been programming on her local version. So her local version is different from this. So it's going to be, I mean, if she was going to do this by hand, it wouldn't work. But because she took a clone originally and, and teammate two just committed this push, Mika could come to a certain place and then do a pull and, and update her local, uh, do a pull request, I guess. And then they have to agree. And if it's approved, she can pull the updated version of the clone. And now, now these three are updated. And so I guess maybe teammate one's got to get up there and do that, but it, they're all working on different parts of an interconnected app. And what happens is that's what the Git is doing is, is traffic controlling all this and figuring all this out. And if you're kind of curious how that happens, what happens is remember primary key and foreign key, there's a bunch of that. There's a bunch of saving keys and trying to figure out like what they'll what they'll do is save the code and compare the new code to the old code and kind of create an audit trail table like these this is before after before after and try to maybe consolidate those changes and then apply them and see if there's any collisions like like deal with collisions i i'm just generically explaining how this versioning works i think okay it's too complicated for me i'm not good at math um, I'm happy somebody built this. It is possible to actually copy a repository from somewhere else. So if, if let's say some, you know, I, I know Natasha, my colleague, put her, um, put these dashboards she designed on GitHub. And so let's, some, let's say somebody wanted to copy your dashboard and start like putting their own labels in it and putting their own data in it. They could just fork that repository into their, make it a repository of theirs, and then just start editing their own version, right? And uh, so I'll, I'll end this part by saying, if you wanna learn how to use the Git and the Git, Git with GitHub, the easiest way to learn it is to actually have a use case, like to need to, to have do group editing. If you just go to a class and learn it, you'll forget it right away. The only, if you don't need to be doing this, it's something you probably won't remember. So, um, okay. So, any questions about Git and GitHub and versioning? Okay. Um, all right. So, in this program, you're going to have a GitHub account. 
And with an account, you'll make a test repository and one repository or folder that will include your code associated with your blog so you can showcase your portfolio projects. Now, if you do something like Natasha did and she actually made um, a dashboard, so if you like make an app or something, it's also possible for you to make other repositories as part of portfolio projects. So I put an example here. So let's say Mika develops a fraud detection algorithm and blogs about it. She builds some big SAS macros. So in her regular blog, her data science journey blog, she can have uh, blog posts about how she built the algorithm and you know working with macros or whatever. Um, and you know she can even show some tricks with macros. But if she actually wants to publish the macros and say, here, come here for these special macros I built, she'll want to put those in their own repository, just, you know, as a way of publishing it. It's kind of like a, our package, right? It's when, and I've, I'll find SAS macros that way, not always on GitHub. SAS users don't use GitHub as much, but we should use it. Um, all right. Um, so the focus for today is we're not going to do any versioning right now or use any apps. But we will set up a GitHub account using the GitHub web page. And I've already done it, and Mika's already done it. Um, so, um, um, well, I've already done um, mine, and Mika's done hers, but we need to keep and Beth do theirs. And we'll create a test repository so we can practice with GitHub. And once you create your first blog post with code, then we'll set up your blog repository together, all right? So today's exercises is we're gonna create our GitHub account if we don't have it and set up um, our profile if we don't have that and set up a test repository if we don't have that. So two of you don't have that, but Mika and I do. Then I'm gonna teach you how to create folders and subfolders in GitHub because it's not obvious. Okay, like it's definitely, I remember the first time I logged into GitHub to make a repository, I was like, I feel like really stupid. Like I should be able to do this and I don't even know what's going on. So there's a bunch, it, it's not hard to use. It's just not really intuitive to be honest. Um, then I'm gonna show you how to upload different kinds of files and folders to the subfolders. And I'll also sort of show you like the poor woman's versioning function. It has a versioning function that you're using in GitHub. So when I was writing that book, I wrote uh, Mastering SaaS Programming for Data Warehousing, um, PAC, the publisher, they created um, uh, their, a repository on their um, server for the code that's associated with the book. So let's say I made some code and I called it CHAP 5.1 read and data, you know, then, um, let, let's say that I updated that code and I went to the repository. If it had the same name, if the code file had the same name and I uploaded it, it would automatically version it. Like I can mass upload edited code that I changed and it'll say it, it knew to update it because of the name, you know, to just replace those because of the name. So it kind of does version even if you're maintaining, like normally when I post for my blog, I post the code when I'm done writing my blog post. So I know it runs, so I probably don't need to change it. But when I was writing that book, I would put some code in the repository and then they'd be like, oh, can you cover this option or something? And I'd be like, okay, well then I'd have to update the code. But when I would drag it over in the repository, the repository just knew which code to replace from the name of the files. And so I'll show you that. Um, and then if we have time, I'll show you, you know, we'll go back to trying to make a readme in our markdown and just practice with it. All righty. So before we actually go to GitHub, I just wanted to sort of show you, I've, I've got these annotated slides here. So I made this annotated slide just to sort of show you what will be on your front page once you get your repository going. So when you create your username, like mine is DeathLunch for my business, that will be your profile name is github.com, whatever that is. And you can see that's my name and then this is my username. And this is an image and then here's like social media connections and um, like a link to my, um, my blog. 
or my yeah. And then up here, see there are four repositories that there's a quick access to them. But this is really the menu at the top. The menu at the top says overview, repositories, projects, packages, and stars. Now this projects and packages is involved with that GitHub version of things. So we're not, I'm not gonna really go over that because I don't know what it is. But we're gonna look at repositories and we're also gonna talk about stars. But on this overview page, you know, they always like to give you a dashboard and these are activity patterns. And, you know, somebody had asked, how often do you post on a blog? And I said, oh, at least once a month. Here, I don't know how to make these things look good. Uh, obviously I have very inconsistent activity. So I'm not so good on the social media part of GitHub. So I, I made a, a close up of my profile. It's nice to have a short sentence under here. I noticed Mika has a really nice short sentence under hers. Um, and so you wanna prepare this information and get your profile like looking nice. All right. Then if you click on the repositories tab, once you have some repositories, It'll show you. So this test repository is the one I think everybody in GitHub needs a test repository because um, because I you have to practice in GitHub before you use it. This one is the repository having associated with my blog. And this one is a repository associated with the self-made courses I make. So it's kind of like I it's like if I had two blocks, right? Like that's now this this is a repository I forked. Remember fork from back here, um, where you can fork a repository. If you're asking me why did I do that, I I this is my memory of it. Is when I was working with Natasha, she got very excited because she went on GitHub and found all these different apps people had built because. What's great about the apps people build is you can fork them. If, if they're almost doing what you want, somebody makes a dashboard that pretty much does what you want, but it's for cars and not healthcare. You want to fork that and then just start editing that, your version of that, right? So she had found a really cool app called Swirl and she said, Monica, you know, you should do this fork it. But I didn't really know what I was doing. So I did it, but, and I don't really know how to edit it. So it's just there. Um, what I probably should have done, you'll see later, is what I probably should have done is star it. I probably did the wrong function with it, but I'll explain that later. All right. Then if you actually go to my blog repository, so if you if you were to click on the top repository, the doing the data repository, which is the one most people are clicking on because it has to do with my blog, this is what it would say up here. And then because you know, this is my blog, so it's got a bunch of folders in it. And you can also put folders within folders. You can nest subfolders. You can be very neat, right? And this is the top part. So one folder per blog post or group of post videos. So like if I do several videos on one thing and several blog posts on one thing with one set of code, then I'll just have one, um, one folder and my readme will refer everybody to all the resources. Sometimes it just is easier that way. Um, but this is the top of this, of my doing the data folder um, repository. And at the bottom, if, if you set up this readme, remember how I said you, you take notepad and you save a file named readme.md, not txt, md for markdown. I was like, md doctor? No, markdown. And you use that R markdown code in it. And if the code refers to pretty pictures and you know how to do it, when you go to up, like see how I, I've uploaded files to GitHub? When you go to upload this file into there, it magically looks beautiful. Like that's the theory anyway. So we'll, we hopefully we'll get to the point of practicing that. All right. And then what I wanted to do was just show you inside one of the smaller folders of um my one of my blog posts that's sort of recent for this program that I made. As you can see, this repository is really short. Like it just has four files in it. It's got this one called GitKeep, which I'll show you. It's got this data set in it and it's got some code here. 
in R and it's got the README, which displays this. So that's a small one. Here's a more traditional example of a very code intensive repository. And this still has a nice README at the bottom, but this is chapter four from my book, that, that um, repository that's associated with the book I wrote. So I've got this folder at the top, this is the close up. And then I've got this git keep. And then there's like chapter four, one proc contents. These are all SAS files, right? And there's just a whole bunch of them. And that's what honestly, most repositories, unless they're feeding apps or they're something to do with apps, they mostly look like that. They don't look little like my blog does. So what I realized when I was preparing this is, you know, this is a social media, but I, I don't even know how to like, comment, subscribe. Like I'm always watching YouTube and I'm like, what do I even do here? Like, like Mika has a profile already. Can I like it? Can I subscribe to Mika? <laughs> like, what do I do? So I asked myself, what are the social media or social connection features on GitHub? And again, I'm talking about GitHub, the web page. Okay. So first of all, the I, I wanted to know if you could follow repositories, right? So let's say you follow my blog and you like the code in it and you wanna know each time my I add code to it, um, what do you do? You know, Do you follow the repository? Well, the answer is no, you cannot follow a repository. You can fork a repository, but what you probably wanna do is if you wanna come back to the repository, what you wanna do is star it which is kind of like bookmarking it. Because you know how like in your email, if you use Gmail, you can star certain emails. Like let's say I put a yellow star in some emails and then it lets you filter by those stars. Well, that's kind of what you're doing. There's a page, if you remember, see this here, the stars, I've just had one star there. If Whatever you have starred will show up on that page. So. If, if you find a repository you wanna be able to come back to, then I would star it, okay? So you can't follow repositories, but you can star them. Can you follow people? And the answer is yes. Actually, this is the main way to find out about updates to repositories. So if people like my repositories, it's probably, rather than just starring them, it's probably better if they follow me even though they're interested in one of my repositories. So, um, and, and how, and you can see here eight followers and one following. And, um, and I actually, I'll, I'll show you me on there. I'll, I'll show you how that works. And so I just wanted to show you, you know, kind of the last sort of a big picture of my main profile page, just so you know what, what yours will look like when it's done. So this is the code to go with my blog. This is this forked repository that I did probably shouldn't have forked. These are, this is code to go with courses I produced. This is a test repository. This is what everybody's been working on here. And this shows when I've updated the repositories over the year. And if you star anything, um, you can find it here. And if you follow people, you can find them here. All right. And in fact, I'm gonna go over here and just show you that. So here's one thing I did is I starred um, I had not actually starred this repository for my book because I didn't know how to do it. And so I started it now and now it's easier to get to. This is automatic. Like this says SAS. See how this is pink for C? There's some analytics going on behind. This says that it, I guess it was forked. I don't know who forked it. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's what happens if you star something. Now, if you go here, like I have eight followers. I had no idea I had eight followers. Here they are, right? Um, oh, I think I know this guy. Um, and I'm only following one person and guess who it is? It's Mika. All right, so Mika's a little ahead of us. We'll go over here. Yeah, see, she's got a nice thing here. And so here, you know, here's her Python challenge. You know, these, these are mostly, um, things that I think you did Mika for exercise, like to learn, right? 
Yeah, that's, I was taking that actually data science boot camp a couple of years ago. Oh, that's right. You told me you took a boot camp. Yeah, that, that's why. So they, um, they made us use this. So that's why I have a few things in there on the yeah. top of that. So they are. Well, you got, uh, look at this. You've got seven followers. You're doing pretty good. <laughs> and you're following six people. Oh, you're not following me. Well, now you're going to follow me, right? What, one thing I do want to point out is you have two achievements, right? So you open pull requests that have been merged. Oh, remember how I was describing that? <laughs> Look at that. Your pull requests were merged. <laughs> Good for you. Mm -hmm. So I, that means the group agreed with her, her coding and they merged it in. Good for you. Mm -hmm. So then, well, aren't you glad you came? <laughs> so here you have the Arctic Code Vault contributor. And I mm -hmm. didn't know what that was. I and no I, 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 I'm in it too. So what I did was I looked at it and I started realizing, you know, you know how Wikipedia is, you know how, like, if you participate, they'll send you stuff, donate, you know, we need to archive everything. We need to keep, you know, kind of like the way back machine people are. Well, you know, whenever you get to open source stuff and open source people, they're always worried about archiving and losing things. Right. So I guess they started this program and they archived some stuff. They archived um, your some of your work, but they've also um, are they also did that to mine, you know, which isn't bad, I guess. Um, but anyway, so um, so now why don't you just take some time, and I'm gonna I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, go ahead and get on. Uh, uh, GitHub. And why don't you try and, you know, with Mika, you can try to um, just, I, I guess, just go to your GitHub and look at things. Um, <laughs> but with Beth, you have to uh, create your GitHub. So do you want to do that? I'm going to make you the host, Mika. All right, go go ahead and share your screen and we'll go look at your, okay. you have a really nice profile here. Okay. So let's see here. So where hmm, your profile doesn't look the same, does it? Uh, um, I don't know the, where to go. <laughs> well, look, I, in, in the upper right, see where your picture is in the upper right? Oh, it's covered by this. Yeah. yeah. See where your picture is? I think if you go there, oh, yeah. does it let you choose your profile? Okay. Yeah, there we go. OK, so here. I'm realizing that mine displays as black, like inverse, and yours is displaying as white. I think you might be able to control that with an option. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't know why yours is white and mine is black. I think I'm too cool for school. Like I was around some engineers or something and I made it black, but okay. Well, let's go to click on the one called testing. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's just look at what is in here. Okay. And um, there's only one file, and it's called greet.py. Okay. Oh, I don't... Yeah, you can you can click on it. It's Python code. It's just oh. a little bit of Python code, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's just go back. So, so I want to see where it says Nagam 29 updated greet.py with additional codes. See where it says that? Yeah, see, yeah, there. Right above it, see what it says there. It says testing slash greet.py. See that? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how GitHub nests things, okay? So why don't you click on the blue testing and we'll go back to the main folder, okay? Now let's say that Mika was programming in Python and she updated the um, file greet.py, like she added all this other code to it. What would happen is, is you see, see where it says, it, see that green code button? To the left of that, it says add file. See that add file button? Oh, file. oh, here. Yeah. If you click on that, 
it says create no file or upload files. Now go ahead and click on upload files. We're not going to upload it, but what I wanted to show you is you can either drag files on there or you can click on that choose your files and you can go and select them and upload them. But what would happen is if Mika on her like local machine or somewhere, she changed that greet.py and just changed all of the code in it. If she went and she uploaded it here, what would happen is see below where it says commit changes. It would automatically fill that in with something like like updated greet.py and you could add notes to it. But of course, if you're just updating your own repository, this the, you don't care about that. This commit stuff is with the notes on it. It's really when you're group programming, when you're trying to deal with, you know, air traffic controlling those things. So if Mika updated the greet.py file and dragged it in there and then hit commit changes, GitHub would just know to replace whatever was in there with the newer version of greet.py and not create a new um, a new file. Now, if she screwed up the name and she called it like greeter.py, it wouldn't version it. It would create a new file called greeter.py and that's its own problem and blah, blah, blah. But if she named it right, not only would it update the file, but it would keep versioning. It would like the Git would keep track of what happened. They'd be able to keep track of all the changes from file to file. All right, well, you can um, hit cancel for that. Then. Okay, now let's pretend that Mika wanted a folder within this folder. So like she wanted to um, like just add, add a file, add a folder. Like let's say she wanted to add a folder named data and put some data files. In. That, I don't know how to do that. Like, like, like it, they, there's no click. There's no place to click that says new new folder. It drove me nuts. I'm going to tell you how you do it. And we're gonna do it together, okay? So first, Mika, go up under add file. Add file, okay. And we're gonna do um, create new file. Okay, see what happens. See how testing, there was a slash and then it says name your file. Well, what we're going to do is name the folder we want inside testing. Okay. So I'm going to tell you to type something, but don't hit enter, Mika. Okay. Just type the letters. Okay. So we're going to type data, D A T A, because that's what we're going to name the folder. Now, type a slash and type a period and type these letters. G I T K E E P, get keep, and then put enter. Now you have your folder. So go click on data next to where you wrote get keep. Do you uh, see where it's blue? This one? Yeah. Oops. Oh, put cancel. Go, I guess you have to scroll down and commit it. Go scroll down. Yeah, I didn't oh, see your commit. You. Commit it. Yeah, you got to commit it. Okay. Now you're like, what is that? Well, now you're in your data folder. Look at the top. It's testing slash data. So let's pretend you had some data files. You would now go to add file and upload them to this data folder. So in other words, you use the git keep file as a placeholder. It's just to keep it there. And git keep doesn't have anything in it. Do you know how hard it was for me to figure this out? There's no instructions. It was like stack overflow taught me this. All right. So now if you click back on testing, Mika, there, there's your data subfolder. Great job. <laughs> Okay, well now let's um, troll Beth a little bit. Beth, how are you doing out there? Okay, go ahead, Beth, and um, <laughs> share your screen. Okay. So this is where I am. Okay, 
So let's see here. Um, I'm kind of confused as to where you are. So go click, see where it says Bethabara, Bethabara? Yes. There's two of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, go go click on that Bethabara. I like that Bethabara. Okay. It seems like you created a repository called Bethabara within Bethabara, within the account Bethabara. Did you mean to do that? No. Okay, well, good job. You created your first repository and you just got a award for it. Let's go click on it. Let's look at your, your repository that you just created. Oh, it must have put you through a wizard and created this. You know how that happened with our blogs, like the it would create a blog? Mm -hmm. So this is... Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know what happened. Like, see, this is trying to get you to use the Git. <laughs> you ready for that? No. <laughs> Me neither. Okay. Yeah. So I would say that you can just leave that there and just kind of ignore it. All right? Okay. All right. So how do I get to that? Like the, um... Well, click back on Beth Abera. Yeah, that. Click on that. That's your profile. Okay. Okay. And then... Okay. I don't know if you want to maybe erase that repository or just leave it there. You can leave it there. Well, let's make a new repository called test. Okay. Um, and I'm not really sure. I, I think, see where it says overview right now, next to it, it says repositories. Can you click on that? Like see where it says overview, repositories, projects, packages. Yeah. Click over there. That's good. Okay. Okay. Now see on the right where it says new. Uh, the green button that says new. Yes. Let's we're going to click that and just call the new repository test. So from now on, you have a test repository. OK, see the repository name. Just type in the word test. OK, now I just want you to scroll down, but don't click anything. Um, See how it says add a readme. Don't add a readme. And then um, like it says add get ignore. I don't know what this is. License none, whatever. Um then click create repository. Like you're fine with all those. Oh my God, and this did it again. Okay, so what I would do is go to test. So click on test. Uh, what's it doing? Oh, I guess this is what it looks like when it's empty. Oh my God, this is ugly. Uh, hmm. We'll go back to Beth Abera. Okay. Now, if you go into test, click on test again and just see what's in there. I think it's just... It looks... It, I can't figure out why all this crap is in there because that wasn't in... I don't remember ever doing this. Okay. Well, why don't we see here? This is code. Go ahead and scroll down. Import code. You know, I think something went wrong when you set up your repository. I think it's like um, something, I don't know what's wrong with it. See that red thing on the top of your screen there? Is it, Maybe that has something to do with it? No, that looks like it's security stuff. Um, actions, setting, insights, issues. See, because it should be like where you can upload code, right? And I don't see a place where you can upload code. Oh, see, scroll to the top. See where it says quick setup. If you've done this kind of thing before, and then it shows this confusing thing, then it says get started by creating a new file. Well, let's create a new file, okay? So the one next to it. So go create a new file. Okay, and you know what I'm going to tell you to name your file? Can you guess? Data? No, git keep. So <laughs> per period. And then G-I-T-K-E-E-P. And then um, go scroll down. Or, or, or no, I think you have to hit enter. Let's see here. Go up. Yeah, hit enter and see if that works. Okay, I guess you had, to, okay, then scroll down and commit it. And let's see what happens. Okay, 
now it looks normal and you have your normal function. So you see what git keep is for? I mean, if you ask me a complex question, like, do you have to write git keep? Can you just put period? Hi, everybody or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why git keep or anything. But now that you created that, you could create a folder. Okay. So now why don't we create a folder called, I don't know, why don't we call it dashboard? just for fun. Okay. So remember how to do that? I'm not sure. Sorry. Sorry. Well, it's a sim it's similar to what we just did. Similar. Okay. You're okay. going to go up to add file. Remember you were just clicking on code, but that green button, but to the left of that green button, there's a white button that says add file. Click on that and do create new file. Okay. Now, let's say that we're going to create a folder called dashboard. Just type the word dashboard and stop. Okay, good. Then put a slash and then type period G I T K E E P. Yep. Then enter or tab out of it, I guess. I usually tab out of it. Um, yeah, just so the internet knows about it, I guess, and then go ahead and commit. Before you commit, see how the, it automatically puts create.getkeep as that notice in there? If we were actually versioning code and we were doing pull requests and stuff, adding that optional extended description can be super helpful because you're just trying to traffic control. But if you're doing what we're doing, just don't, I don't even read this stuff anymore. So go ahead and commit the new file. Okay, very good. So let's say that Beth wanted to create a readme for the repository. She would have to click back on test to be in the root directory and upload the readme.md to that. If she wanted to create a readme for just the folder dashboard, then she'd have to be in here when she uploaded her readme.md. And how that would happen is, go ahead, Beth, and click on add file again on the right and see how upload file is an option. Well, that's what, let's pretend Beth made a dashboard and she wanted to upload the, the R or Python file she made. That's the way she'd do it. She'd go to upload file and then choose all her code and just throw it on here. But if she wanted to um, make a readme, then she'd carefully make that readme.md, try to make it right, and upload that. Now, if she screws up, it's no problem. She can actually edit. She can just go to edit and actually edit the the um, code, the md, the readme right there. The th trick is you want to you. The best scenario is where you create one in Notepad that doesn't have any problems with it and you just upload it and everything's fine. Mm -hmm. If you do, like, let's say you think it's fine and it's not fine and you upload it, it's usually one little thing is screwed up and you just kind of fuss with it until you get it right. But if I, I learned the hard way that you have to try by starting by uploading that because that communicates with Git. This readme.md says, oh, this is Markdown and you're trying to make a readme, let me, evaluate it that way all right okay so then um uh any questions so far yeah i was just wondering like when i go here um yeah go ahead i wanted to see my profile and so, yeah see see ed, oh, edit profile okay. do, do you see edit profile below that green t on the left okay okay so let's go there so you can actually put your real name there. And if you scroll, let's just look at what's there, Beth. Um, okay. Or you might as well put your name there since you clicked on it. But um, okay, so then you have a little bio. That's what I say. I'm like an epidemic. I see. Okay. And so you can actually really customize this. You can mm -hmm. put a link to your blog or if you're on Twitter, you can do that. Um, and so you're going to, and you can also put a real picture. You know, it doesn't have to be of you. It could be of anything. But um you you probably want to actually do that, you know, because like, look at how beautiful Mika's looks. Mine looks so nice. I know, she looks, looks so nice. Like, yes. We want to be classy. You look like a scientist. 
Oh, great. <laughs> so do you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so does we. So we all look like scientists. So we might as well go on. Um, all right. So um, yeah, so you probably want to do that, Beth, you know, when you have a chance. And mm -hmm. um uh, yeah, I don't have any picture on this laptop, but I should be um I'm I'm sure you have willing <laughs> family. In the cloud, but I should have. <laughs> well, if you got willing family members, maybe you can get a gorgeous uh <laughs> like a glamour pick or something I'll um, try. <laughs> all right so mika how are you doing okay so there so you made you made that um folder right mm -hmm. and then um let's see i was gonna say let's make some fake files well let's see here see see how it says in the middle what she last did it's this create get keep um do you have do you have any code just lying around on your computer, Mika? Uh, I think I have. You could you can try to up. Let's go into the data folder. Go ahead and click on the data folder, right? Even though it says data, you don't have to upload data into it. I just you know, we can probably rename folders. I just want to show you everybody what it looks like when you add files. So you see where it says add file? Uh, there. Why don't you upload like a random code file you have in any version? Oh, okay. So do this. Well, because doing, I just have a maybe a basic uh, question, but, but what's that? Um, okay. Go ahead. So if I have some code in R, um, but I don't have like, um, it's not connected to the data source or the data, then how does it know? Like, how does it know to render that? Well, what happens is if you're doing what I'm doing in my blog is I'm just teaching people um, here's code you can use and to analyze data. And it's like um, it's like assembly required. You have to lock, download the data set and you have to download this code. And then if you use this code with the data set, it'll work. Right. So it's kind of like a tutorial where you download this, you download that or whatever. But if you're like, well, Monica, what if I make an app that just runs? And I'm like, well, that that's that's when you get into connecting a creating a front end like in Python or R, and creating a back end in Python or R, and making them run. And you can do that on GitHub. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. We're gonna like the thing I just described is too hard for me. I, I'm being honest. If you wanted to do it, I'd figure it out. But when Natasha wanted to do it, she managed to figure it out on her own. So I didn't totally understand it. Um, but that's what she did with her app, her her um, dashboards is she made them into applications that actually run on GitHub, but that's in its own folder. Like if you go to that folder and basically what happens is there's a file you click on that launches the application and then it just runs. It like runs in your browser, you know? Mm -hmm. But if she wanted to make a blog post about that and put some code in the blog post, that would be in like a blog, you know, folder. And that would be the thing where you here, you know, here's some example hospital data and here's some code that works with it, but it's not the whole app or anything that you could use. All right, does that make sense? It does. And then, um, yeah. Um, uh, how is that when it's related to like our markdown then? Well, our markdown is mainly a thing to make stuff look pretty on the web, right? Like static stuff, like H T. it's basically like HTML, only it's if you're using a lot of code, HTML, is, it's hard to get HTML to make code look nice. Mm -hmm. So they created our markdown so you can use those commands. So our markdown tells it to make HTML that makes it look nice. It just makes it easier because our markdown created commands we want to use all the time for coding and stuff, for displaying code. And HTML doesn't really have that. They have commands for looking pretty and animation, you know, but they don't really care about code. So they didn't do that. So our markdown is basically another language where they're like, okay, we created these shortcuts. And then when you submit it, it gets translated to HTML and then displayed, right? Which becomes a problem because sometimes our markdown doesn't get translated right to HTML. It doesn't look that good. But when we do a readme in GitHub, it's like one of the only things you do with storing something in a repository to make 
prettiness happen. Most of the time, it's just ugly code. And so the whole point of the Markdown Notepad README is that, remember when I was showing you before in another meetup, how I was showing you an old repository where I didn't know how to do that. And it says read me and it just looks like code. It says, okay, this is for BRFSS. It looks really ugly, right? Mm -hmm. And so um the arm this our markdown trick with the it's kind of like the special hack for GitHub is that if you do um yeah, that looks like what you did is some sort of hello world there. Um it's it's like if you create this if you follow these secret rules where you create this notepad document and you call it README and you save it with .md for markdown. And then you put markdown code in it that Git understands it's not screwed up. And then you do that upload file into a folder on GitHub and everything's right, it'll look beautiful. Like it's kind of like the secret thing that people, everybody knew but me, you know, kind of like the Git keep thing. So, um, so Mika, are you having trouble finding a file to upload? You can upload anything. Actually, Try to... I found it. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead and um, go back to your GitHub. I just want to show okay. people what it looks like to, um, oh, what for. I think it's the left of that. Yeah, there you go. Oh, you got to commit some, or no, you're going to upload. It. So see where yeah. it says, choose your files in the middle of the screen. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. click on that. If you just are uploading one file at a time, you could click on that. Now here you could pick anything to upload. Like oh, try okay. try to I mean it's nice to upload, you know, code, yeah. but you could really theoretically upload anything. You know. I know this folder has stuff in it. Ah, the bunch of Jupyter notebook in there. So just do this. I guess open. Okay, yeah, let's just see what it does. Okay, see how it says clean underscore program. See on the left of Mika's um, image there, her mm -hmm. picture. Oh, it says okay. clean underscore program dot IPYNB. Okay, now go ahead and click on choose your files again, Mika. Choose. Uh, no, no, go, go ahead up there yeah. and choose it again. And let's pick a different file. Let's pick a different type of file. Different type of file? Like, I see think. where it says program cleaner and it's a text document? Yeah. You can choose that one too, right? Now, see program underscore cleaner dot txt. That could be opened in Notepad. But if you save your readme as readme dot txt, it's not going to do the markdown thing. You have to save it as dot md or it doesn't know what's going on. All right. So you can see how, like, when I upload a file from SAS, it says, like, you know, read in data dot SAS. And you saw the other one was PY. So GitHub knows what PY is and knows what SAS is. That's why it makes those little circles and it says what color they are. And it seems to know what we're doing here, you know, when we're adding full files. So go ahead. Why don't you commit those? And we'll just see what it looks like. Okay. Now go mm -hmm. ahead and click on the data folder here and we'll see them it, because we put them in the data folder, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, again, if, if Mika changes one of these programs but keeps the name the same, what she could do is like, see, let's pretend you changed clean underscore program, right? If you did that, you wouldn't have to do anything special, Mika. You could just go up to add file and choose it again. Like for instance, let's say you changed it right now, uh, at, yeah. which you didn't. But if you did change it, if on your local machine, you change clean underscore program again, you could just go add file as long as it has the same name and GitHub would automatically update it. So let's pretend Mika that you'd made like 10 code files that were A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And you'd move them all over to this repository. And you said, Monica, I made all my code. And let's say I downloaded the code and I was running the code and I had some criticism. 
and I suggested you make some changes. And I said, why don't you change some of these files? And you went through and you didn't really create any new files. You just on your local machine changed all those files. What you could do is do upload files again and just upload them again. And GitHub would just, as long as they have the same name, it would just update the repository with the newest. And you'd be able to see, see where it says add files via upload, create git keep. And so it would just keep track of it. It would just update the code. But that's not usually our problem. Like I had that problem when I was um, writing that book because I'd create some code and we'd upload and we decide it was fine. But then the book reviewer would suggest like, why don't you demonstrate this uh, option or something? And so I'd have to update all this code, but I never had to really worry about which code I updated. Like, let's say I just updated some of chapter four code. I could just drag all the code into there. I don't, I, I didn't need to remember when I last versioned it because GitHub would figure it out. And then I just do a big commit. So it won't necessarily duplicate them. It will just update that. Okay. Yeah. So let's say I had 10 code files and I putzed around with the ones. As long as I didn't change the names, right. I could drag them all over, over there and, and GitHub would be like, well, one of these you didn't even update. It's just like what I already have. So I'm not going to update that one. I'll update the other ones, you know? Okay. So that's what's kind of cool about. So in that case, even if you're sharing a project um, where you're both building code like in SAS, you can have a repository where you share the repository by hand, you know, where you just by hand add files as long as they stay the same name. And that tends to be the problem. Because if I'm building, that's why I like Dropbox with SAS. If I'm building code files in SAS, sometimes I sneak in a file or I change the name. It's The code does a slightly different function. And GitHub doesn't like that very much. So, okay. So is everybody ready to try to make a README? Do you guys have that README from before the, when I was trying to teach you our markdown? Before we go there, I was gonna practice doing, if I wanted to say um, the WordPress, I don't know if Mika was just trying to do that. If I want to link it or bring it to GitHub, can I just copy the link and upload it or just how do I direct it? Yeah, I'll show you um, what I do. So a normal person would just like here, download the data from and code from my repository on GitHub. If I back, okay, when I first made this blog, if you clicked on this, you would go directly to the exact repository. So you know how this is about a Likert plot? You would, that link used to lead to this link right here. Now, why do I say used to? It's because I learned something. I learned how to do marketing and get a mailing list. So if you set up, like, you don't have to do this. I have a business, so I have to do this. If you set up a mailing list software, like MailChimp is what I use, but you can use other ones. Sometimes like you want to add um, people to the mailing list, but how do you add people to the mailing list? Well, what you do is if they click on something that you're going to give them, like a report or a free template or something, you route them through the mailing list so that they sign up for your mailing list and then the mailing list hands them over. It's like a little web page. So if you click on this now, you're gonna pro you're gonna get probably that mailing list thing. Yeah, here. And if you do, you can just like if I put it in here, what happens is it doesn't record it again because like GitHub, it goes, you know, it knows I'm already in there. But this is where it used to lead is directly to here. And as you can see, here's my Git. See, doing the data, Likert plot hack, that's the name of this. Okay, I don't know where it went. This is this readme, which I uploaded. See that? And if you're like, well, I, I like that readme. You know, I, I can just open this. And you can do this too, if you follow me. You can go here and you can actually copy this out. Like, let's, let me open Notepad here. If I go here, see there's like a line numbers, but they don't copy when you copy them, okay? And so I copied this and I'm just putting it here, okay? They'll say cancel changes. Now, 
let's say I wanted to change this, like I wanted this to say SAS or something. I can just change this. You know, I could just make this say SAS and it would be fixed, right? And you see it up here. You know, I could change the name. I don't want to change the name. So cancel changes. So that's this where you can, uh, this raw and blame. I, I don't know what that's about. It has to do with the versioning. But every time people try to explain what blame is to me, they say it's not really blame. Like you're not blaming anybody for doing it. It's more like figuring out why something got screwed up. Like not a person, but what happened. I, I don't know. But I always just think raw and blame. That's kind of scary. But anyway, so if you want to steal anything from me, um, directly any of these uh, uh, markdowns, you can start by going like this and then copying this and then um, putting it in Notepad where you can edit it and then just do cancel, okay? So here's Notepad. And remember, this is an R markdown. And I just wanted to compare this to you. So see how we start with this kind of nice big heading that says files from how to make a Likert scale plot in R? Well, if you remember from um, HTML, when we looked at HTML, we became aware of the headings, H1, like the headings page, H1, H2, H3. And those are such a pain to type. Like if you remember, like if I would have to do H1 um, files from how to make a Likert scale. And, R. and then I'd have to do the end tag. This is HTML. That's how I would have to type this first line in HTML. See, this is right. a pain. Okay. So Markdown said, okay, we're going to change these rules. Instead of H1, H2, H for the headings, we're going to do Hashtag. this thing for okay. the headings, right? which of course screws me up because that's used for comments in R, so I'm already screwed up. Yeah. So, okay, so then also in HTML, it's super complicated to figure out how to make a link. But what you do here is you put the brackets around the thing that you want to be hot for the link, like the word blog post, see that? And then right after it in parentheses, you put the link where it goes, okay? So I'm saying these files go with this blog post, and that's hot, and it goes to this link. And this video on YouTube, and that's hot, and it goes to this YouTube link. All right? Mm -hmm. So then the next step is actually in HTML, okay? It's not in our markdown. The reason it's in HTML is I could not get our markdown to work. I just couldn't get it to work. Um, or I, I think this is in HTML and now our markdown. But I just had trouble. So one of the our markdown has some issues with displaying images the way it's supposed to. So I just did this. I got this to work. So what was I doing? I was trying to make this image. And it's not just I'm making the image show up. I want it to be a hot image. Like if you click on it, you get to the video. See how sexy that is? I wanted too much. I wanted it all. So I had to do a lot to get it all. Let's see what happened here. So first, if I had just wanted the image, it would be this thing right here. So this is an image tag. So the image width is 720. Border equals zero. I guess it doesn't have a border. A line is center. And this says SRC. It's a source, which is, you can probably tell where it's, like, see this WP-content uploads? Whenever you see WP-content, it's a word, it's the WordPress media place, you know, because this is deathwench.com. So this is already my blog. And you can kind of tell it's in WordPress because it says WP-content. And you know, it's going to WordPress's media on that blog and trying to display something that's hosted on that server that's some sort of media. And if you read it, it's make Likert cover slide YouTube, which makes sense. 
this alt here is what it will display if you hover over it, right? But nor, if if somebody is using, like I, I actually in Minnesota, when I used to live there, I had a friend who was blind. And when she used the computer, she used this um, application called JAWS. And what it would do is it, so blind people get really good at hearing and you can talk really, really fast and they hear everything, okay? And so if you ever, like if blind people ever listen to books being read and you listen to that, it's going a hundred miles a minute, okay? It's like faster than you're used to. So because of that, they can handle, like what they'll do is mouse over stuff and the voice will just say it really fast. So like, do the data, blah, 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 blah. that's what one computer, blah, 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 blah. you know, they'll do that. But this image, you can see that it says how to make a Likert scale plot in R, but for that JAWS, they, it doesn't know what it says. So if you put in this alt, like I did, where's my thing here? This alt here, that's what JAWS is gonna read. It's Likert scale plot in R, video and blog post. <laughs> I so used to my listening to my friend's jaws because she'd be like, "Oh, Monica, I can just send them an email," and she turned it on. Blah 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 blah. This jaws would start going crazy. Um, but anyway, so then, see here, this opens a paragraph. This is nested here. This opens a paragraph. This is that whole image. So A is a link, and slash A is closing that, and then. I guess this is supposed to be a closed paragraph. I don't know what happened here. I think this is supposed to be a closed paragraph, but I didn't screw I screwed it up or something. Um, oh wait, I wasn't gonna say that. But anyway, somehow I got it to work. So um do either of you have a markdown um notepad MD thing you were working on that maybe you want to just upload to the test thing to see how it goes? Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is find me, okay? So go ahead and see in the upper left where you can search. Yeah, search for Death Wench, I guess, or Monica, I guess. Oh, NCH, yeah, there, yeah, I don't know why LCH, it's NCH. No, you did it right, NCH. Okay, and then enter. I just because that's my username. Oh, it's searching within your repository. I don't know how to get out of there. I guess click on click on that little um, logo on the way left. And I think that you can search out there then. Yeah. So find a repository. See that find a repository. I guess see if you can type death wench in there and you'll find something. Maybe not. I, I don't know if that'll work, but. Or, okay, that won't work because it's M O N I K. <laughs> I, are you, oh, are you not? I mean, you have to hit enter, I think, for it to execute the search. Oh, it's not doing anything. Okay, we'll click up at the top and do search up there again, I guess. I, I know I found Mika this way. Okay, enter and let's see what you got. Yeah, there it is. Um, see that death wench doing the data? Go ahead and click on that. Okay, now if you wanna come back to that, I think you can star it. See where it says star two here? like. See to the right where on uh, see where it says watch fork and star. I think if you ch look at what yeah there you go. Now if you go back to your um profile, see in the upper right. No, that's my profile now. Yeah, if, if you go back to your profile and um go to your profile, go down. Right there, there you go. Now click on see across the top where it says stars. If you click on that, then if you scroll down, you can get back to mine. See that? Okay, now I want you to click on the death wench part or just death wench doing the data. And then 
what I want you to do is click over on death wench just on the way left where it says death wench doing the data at the upper left just click on the death wench part. Okay, now you're at my um, profile. So if you scroll down, oh, see under my name, it says follow. Why don't you follow me? Okay, very good. Now, if you scroll up again, and you can click back to your profile in the upper right, and go back to your profile. Yeah, there you go. Now, if you go and you look, you see how it says one following, okay? So you can get back, easily get back. Like if you click on that one following, just click on that for a second. It'll give you the list of everybody you're following. So, and, and why don't you go follow Mika? So go up into, um, I guess you have to go back to the beginning in, in the logo. See, remember when you clicked on that logo? Okay, now go ahead in that, uh, in the top part next to the logo and search for NAG or you want to search for Mika? Well, good luck. I, I was going to tell you to search for her. It, it's N-A-G-A-M A and then M as in Monica and then 029 and then enter. Oh, they couldn't find any repositories. Hmm. So uh, maybe you have to go to people to look. No, actually, so that uh, N-A-G-A-M 29. Oh, just 29. Okay, yeah. I screwed up. There's no zero. Okay. Yeah, but it's still oh. not finding. Here, why don't you put... um. Oh, yeah. what, what's one of the repository? Oh, there you are, users. Oh, look at how smart you are. Okay, go over there. And now you can, you follow her. You would follow her, whereas you star the repositories. Yeah, good job. See how great. See, now you can steal from two people. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't you go back to stars, you know, because on your stars, or no, that's Mika's stars. Why don't you go back to your stars, I guess? Um go back to your profile like see you're i'm making you go all over the place now um okay now go to your stars okay now let's scroll down to doing the data and let's click on that okay now let's teach you how to steal from me why don't you go ahead and open a, a notepad document okay so so Okay, so you have your note, your notepad application open on a blank thing there. Okay, yes. so I want see the top thing that says benchmarking runtime. Let's just mm -hmm. click on that just for because that's a simple readme. I kind of remember that. Okay, so now if you scroll down, or you could also click on that. Um, Here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and click on that. I mean, it's displayed at the bottom. I'm just trying to see what would happen. Oh, see, it brings it up. Now, if you want to steal the code from it. What you want to do is see that, see where it says raw and blame and to the right of it, there's this pen. Mm -hmm. Click on the pen and you never have to really worry that you're accidentally screwing up my code because you don't really have an access, like you can't change the code. Okay. okay, now click in the middle there, just click in there, just anywhere in there and do control A because that'll highlight everything. Okay, now do control C because that'll copy everything. And then go into your note notepad uh, and click Control V for paste. And then let's bring the notepad over to the, the um, screen so we can see what we've got. So we were just looking at this. And as you can see, so what we can, even though we can't see it rendered, we, we know from my little thing I just did is that the first line is going to be H1, heading one, benchmarking runtime. Right. And the second one says these files go with the following blog posts. Well, let's say, um, Beth, that you wrote a blog post that was about um, rainbows. You could put just change benchmarking runtime to rainbows. Okay. And then it says these files go with the following blog posts. Yeah. So why don't you do that? Just change it to rain. I'm just coming up with something silly benchmarking rainbows yeah that sounds good okay 
So these files go with the following blog post. Well, this is a little deceptive, right? Because the first thing that href is the link for the blog post, but that src is the link to the image, right? So the you have to know to replace your that one next to the href with your link to your blog post, right? Mm -hmm. And so like if you have your blog up, you could get a link from it. And just what, what I would recommend you do, though, is, you know, how like in Word, if we're using Microsoft Word or even more programming, we usually just highlight something and then we just paste over it. I don't do that with this. What I'll do is I'll click, see where it says deathwench.com, data set slash, and then there's a quote. What I do is I click before the quote and I back up manually until those two quotes are next to each other. And then I copy the link and I put my cursor between them, and do paste. Otherwise I get all screwed up, okay? And so once you get your link, you would put it in there, but you don't have one. So we're gonna just leave it, okay? okay. And then um, for now, just leave the image with like that. And then the source, if you actually had an, a link for an image on WordPress or whatever, or somebody else's image, you could change that SRC to that. But we don't have that now, so we'll just use what's there. Okay, now you're ready to steal my README, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to go up to File, and I want you to do Save As, and now we're going to do something tricky, okay? Now, probably you want to save it on your desktop or somewhere where you can find it right away, you know, just for like, is there a, yeah, that's a good place. Now, see down there where it says star.txt, get like, see below, beneath it where it says text documents, choose all files. Okay, now type in all caps readme and then .md. That's how you force it to be, um, I see, okay. You're just forcing it. Now, if you just reflect on that for a second, every single blog post you have that has a GitHub for it is probably gonna have this exact file named readme.md. So you need to have a different folder, uh, you know, when you're staging your blog post, remember staging a blog post, you, it, it, how I say make a folder for each one and put all the images and everything in there mm -hmm. so you don't get confused. Well, this is one of those things you should put in there because they're going to be different for each one. All right. Okay. Very good. Now, what we're going to do is just get out of here because you're just stole. So you want to go back <laughs> to your profile. <laughs> so, so go back to your profile. Yeah, good. Job. Get out of there before anybody catches you. <sighs> I'm just teasing. All right, let's go back to your test um, repository. There we go. Okay, let's go into dashboard and pretend this is the readme for dashboard, okay? okay. Now, what we're gonna do is to go to the add file and do upload files. And that's where you're gonna upload. Go ahead and choose this, your files. And then you gotta find your, your desktop again. Yeah, you're better at this than I am. What I do, oh, there, I cheat by going date modified. I just sort by, but you found it. They're good for you. Okay. Now, if you yeah. scroll down, it, you see it, you see it on the list that it's going to commit. Now go ahead and click commit changes. And let's see what happens. Oh, it's chewing through it. Okay. Now go ahead and click on dashboard and let's see if it worked. Well, look at that. that is so down. Cool. Yeah, yeah, let's see how it worked. Yep, yep. <laughs> now, let's say that you didn't like, let, let's go down a little bit. Go ahead and scroll down. Let's say you didn't like how small that image is, okay? Go ahead and click on the, the pen. Okay, let's go, see where it, the line seven where it says image width is 360? Yeah. Okay, let's just change this to something kind of big, like 600 and see what happens. So we'll do 600 and then scroll down and go ahead and commit. And then let's see it. 
See, it's huge now. Yeah. So the reason I had you do that is starting the read me can, is kind of challenging. But once you get it in there, if you don't like how it looks, you can futz with it then. It's, it knows what you're doing and it's going to display it right. If it, of course, if you screw up the code, it'll just look like normal. It'll, it won't render right. But then you have to just keep fixing fussing with it to so you can get there all right well good job beth do you have any questions before i make you stop sharing your screen or you already did <laughs> obviously you don't have any questions do you have any questions <laughs> no that was great i uh, okay. i like doing stuff like this okay, i feel good. like i accomplished something so yeah yeah you did a good job good job mm -hmm. and, and then mika do you have any questions you want to try doing a read me yeah, I did. I was following it and uh, I was nice. able to upload that readme MD file. Yeah. And it looked I'm going to step away for two minutes, but I'll be back. OK, OK. Um, And, and it looked good, Mika? Yeah. Do you, do yeah. You, yeah. OK, well, good, yeah. good job. Well, great. There are lots of, uh, there are lots, actually, so if you Google it, you can find a few markdown cheat sheet for the GitHub. Yeah, so remember, back when I did my HTML, it's actually a workshop, right? So um, I'm going to just open the R Markdown presentation, which you have access to. You can go back to this. But remember how I was saying, like, um, I was, I gave you this editor. This is not the best editor in the world, but I looked around for a pretty good editor. And uh, I like this one. And the reason why I like this one is, um, The way it worked is you could see it render on the right and you could see the code on the left. So you could mm -hmm. kind of shop for what you were looking for. Like you want to make this fancy thing. The thing that's bad about this is it easily gets desynchronized from each side. Like right now, this is doing all these headings, but that's not what this is showing, right? Mm -hmm. See this table of contents? That's up here and this is down here and they're just synchronized and so this can be confusing but what's easy about it is let's say that i want to use let's say that i want to somehow replicate this fancy thing what i can do is i can just get rid of everything else you know like see table contents and i just want to replicate this fancy thing i can just get rid of everything and then work on this in the editor right like if I want this, for example, <laughs> let's see here. We were just, I'm, see, I've got, um, this is an image, right? This is, this is my Likert skill plot mm -hmm. image. So let's say I go over here and I put, uh, that there, <laughs> see how that is? So let's say I, I fuss with this and I make it beautiful. I change all these things. I get it all nice. It's going to go away, right? The minute I leave this web page, all my work will be gone. That's why Notepad. That's why I have Notepad ready. And when you get this all nice, you copy it out and you put it um, in your Notepad. And you don't have to start by saving it as our markdown. You know, like you don't have to, you can name it like, like draft while you're working on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, because you might, <laughs> you might be, um, you might have a big one. Like once in a while, people will have really big readmes because they kind of need to, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, like I kind of needed a big readme here, you know, because I wanted to show my book and, you know, doing this was a, was hard right like i i tried to do it right but to be honest with you i just kind of got maybe the top part right and uploaded it and then i just kept adding code to it you know i got this link to work i got this and added it then i thought oh i want this part so i wrote that and then i just added it i just kept slowly adding it because look at all these links right when you go and you look at this one oh my god it's kill a horse see all that and it's mm -hmm. so hard to see and everything. Well, I, you know, I was fussing with an editor and saving things in Notepad. And probably if you make 
our markdown readmes for GitHub, like that's your job. There's probably some good editing tools and I'm doing it the hard way, but we're, we don't do that that often. So you might as well just kind of do it the hard way. Okay. All right. Yep. Well, good. Well then do we have any questions? Uh, I'm not fine. Yes. I, I, what did you say, Mika? Oh, I just, I just said that. So I'm good for now. You're good for now. Well, you you know, you can have questions in the future. I got more yeah. answers for you. I'm full of answers. You know me. I'm full of a lot of things. What, what about you, Beth? Do you have any questions for today? No, I think I'm good. But um, so what do you suggest we do for practice and um, for the next? Well, what I feel like is for now, let's not worry about GitHub for now. I just wanted to show you how to do it and get you set up. Okay. For now, we're working on um, portfolio projects, right? And as we work on portfolio projects, we'll have things to say on our blog. And I still don't have that video out for you, but I promise I'll get it for you. The best practice of how to fight with that WordPress blog editor. But so what I would say to you, Beth, is focus on the portfolio projects in the blog and as soon as you have a blog post that has code in it, mm -hmm. then we'll turn back to GitHub. Okay. So what probably, I haven't ever seen anybody in this program yet actually stage a blog post, like write that Word document with words and, uh, you know, have a whole folder in Dropbox where we have a, the Word document and all the pictures you're going to use. And if there's code, all the code you're going to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and again, right now, if you do a stage of blog post, it doesn't have to have, it shouldn't probably have any code. It should probably be just about the topic you're going to talk about. Like, maybe I didn't share it, but I have done, um, I have done one. Okay. Well, we're, we're like meeting tomorrow, so you can show. So me. I'll show you. Yeah. yeah. What I have, but yeah. I mean, it was just for the practice one. So, and then I haven't revisited it yet. So, um, well, That's well, you, okay. you probably if you if you want, you can make um a blog post, stage a blog post about like wastewater or something. Like I think that's short. what I want to do. Yeah. 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 Okay. Why don't you why don't you try that? Make like a, a a folder in Dropbox and just try to make a short, it doesn't have to be very long, but just have some information, you know, maybe from the internet or you know, anything that's public about it or, or just some topic, you know, that you think would be useful that will relate to what you're doing. Okay. And maybe, maybe you know, just have a few links and 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 an image because then we can practice with your blog and practice making a blog post, right? Okay. Can and, I prep that for the next, not tomorrow's meeting, but then when we meet uh, early next group meeting? month? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great thing to prep for that. And you, okay. you too, Mika, if you want, yeah. you can try to stage a blog post for that. Again, just about the topic and actually mm -hmm. Mika, what you could talk about, I, I, I don't like to assign people topics, but you could write a blog post about that dashboard you showed us last time in San Diego. I mean, that oh. would make that would make it just a great blog post where you just talk about that and you talk about mm -hmm. what you like about it or, you know, anything you want, what, okay. you know, but you know, it doesn't have to be very long, but that's exactly what people do on their data science journey. They make little blog posts like that they practice with WordPress, they practice with, um, you know, communication. And it's not, it's not as awesome as making a blog post with code, but you can't do that every day, right? You know, you're gonna, you have to work really hard to get the project done first before you're ready with, you know, something like that. So it's just a way in, in between to, to practice and um, with, with blogging, with fighting with WordPress without having a heart attack because you have to also fight with GitHub do, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. So why don't we try that to stage a simple blog post? Just stage it. I'll get mm -hmm. our video out about how to put it in. Probably I'll do that before our meeting. But then once I do the video, I can even kind of demonstrate what was in the video and we can practice with our blogs if we want. Um, or whatever, whatever you want. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Right. Okay, well, we're at time, so I should probably end the workshop. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for watching this video, which is part of the Public Health to Data Science rebrand program. If you are interested in joining the program, please sign up for a 30-minute Zoom interview using the link in the description.